Hi there, everybody. Looks like we are live and it's working today. <laughs> uh, if you're new, I'm Scott. I'm with Artist Network. This is Drawing Together. So we're meeting every Monday and Wednesday at this time to draw together. Um, last week was challenging. We had a major outage across a large portion of northern Colorado. Um, so I apologize for that. If you, if, you, um, if you missed it, we posted the recording. So I ended up doing the, uh, completing the PE demo, posting it as a recording to the YouTube channel so you can follow along there if you'd like. Um, so hopefully this goes smoothly. Um, makes life exciting, doesn't it? So um, the, the uh, reference image is in the uh, description below. So find that, bring that up, you can follow along. You should be able to print up the, the image or I'm working from a screen that's up to me on my left. Uh, and that is, so that's what, I'm, that's what I'm working from. So rather than having a tablet or something printed out in front of me, I, I like actually, and I, I'm enjoying having this screen and set up here. So um, I'll be working in charcoal today. So I've got my vine charcoal sticks, I've got my shading stumps, and I've got my charcoal pencils here. So sharpen on one end and then I use a razor blade on the other to kind of expose more of that core. Um, all of these uh, principles, though, should, um, you should be able to apply them to any medium. So if you're working in graphite, um, I think you'll be able to follow along as well. Um, I, I'm seeing a lot of comments in the thread about portraits and um, you know, some of you love them, some of you do not. <laughs> and and I, um, I am in that camp where I've always struggled with portraits. So that's one of the things that I'm really um, excited about uh, in this series is that we're here to kind of challenge ourselves and embrace subjects that we don't normally embrace, try new processes, um, try to approach drawing in perhaps a different way. Um, so with, um, with portraits, I've always struggled with kind of getting the proportions right. Um, and if you look back in the series, I've done a couple portraits so far to um, varying degrees of success. And as you know, I've, I've struggled through them. Um, I feel more confident with this, and that's really the way um, things go, right? The more time you put into something, the more you practice, the better you get at it. And so I feel like I'm getting better. Um, but each drawing is a new experience. This is the one I did in advance um, to kind of test out the subject, test out the process and get my head around it. Um, but there's a very high likelihood that, you know, this could all fall apart. I don't really know how this is going to go. Um, I'm going to do my best to try to replicate this because I feel like I got the proportion pretty well dialed in. Um, having said that, so one of the things that we try to encourage in our Drawing Together series is um, kind of open and um, respectful communication around suggestions. I like to have suggestions come from you. So throughout the process, feel free to call out any questions, throw out suggestions if you see a proportion that's off, you know, values, things like that. Um, I, I, I enjoy that and I, I kind of feed off of that. And I like it when it becomes collaborative in that nature. Um, so I'm going to work through my process and, and I like to have things kind of come together all at once. So I'll be working on the proportions, but throughout the whole process, I'll be continuing to adjust it and gradually refine it. Um, so I just want to put that out in there in the beginning. Um, like I said, I welcome comments and suggestions and, uh, and I've really enjoyed what you as a community, how you all have done that. Um, you've been communicating uh, very well around that. All right, so I've got my paper. This is cut down to 11 by 14. It's relatively smooth. Um, what I found worked well in that earlier stage is to actually start my drawing by laying out some of the proportions using my old shading stump. You can see it's got a, a fair amount of charcoal on it. Um, this is a step that's really tripped me up in the beginning. I found that sometimes in my initial stages, it, it sends me off in a direction that's difficult to come back from. And so what I'll often do is just I'll end up making too much of a mess, make too declarative of a mark at the beginning. And so with the shading stump, it allows me to sneak up on it a little bit more. Um, this is a Hanamula uh, Skiza paper. Let me see if I can bring up that pad again. Um, you know, I found that it's difficult to, to find a location. And some of you have asked this before, like where, where I get it. Um, this was mailed to me. Um, and I went to my local retailer where, where I've gotten in the past and they don't have any I'm trying to find it online. I did find that Blick has some, but I don't know if they have this specific paper. But this is what I'm using right now, and it seems to work out well. Um, but if you also have, you know, whatever paper you have that works for you, I think is, is going to be it's going to be just fine. Um, uh, Sharon, you have a question about the graphite pencils. I have 2B, 4B, 6B, and 8B. Um, I would. I generally, when graphite, I like the softer um, pencils just because it. it has the ability to extend the range of values a bit farther, closer to, to charcoal. So the 8B is, might be what you can give a shot at, you know, but it, it 
kind of keep in mind that it, it, it's a darker, it's a heavier mark kind of initially, um, but that might give you a closer kind of approximation to what I'm doing on the charcoal. Um, so, all right, I'm gonna get started here. I first wanna do, what I first wanna do is let, kind of lay out the portrait, get a sense of where I'm gonna be. So I just like to give myself some parameters um, so if I, if I kind of place the chin here, place the top of the head up here, now I have a region within which I can, I can work. Um, and as I've mentioned uh, throughout the series, this initial phase is all about um, getting marks on the page, not necessarily making them um, accurate or correct, but getting something on there that I can then react to. Uh, so this is a very gestural mark. I'm starting to think through uh, where you know where everything goes kind of reacting kind of quickly and getting a sense for if everything is going to fit on the page um, and again just getting information on the page that I can react to so what I'm doing is I'm looking up at the screen in front of me um, and you're going to see me kind of work quickly back and forth and it might be helpful at this in this early stage to um, kind of intentionally kind of lock your eyes on the photo. You know, try to almost think about it as, uh, you know, about 75% of my attention is on the reference photo. About 25% of my attention is, is what's happening on the page. Um, and, this, and then as we move through the drawing, perhaps it uh, increases, but I want to, um, I'm almost drawing from my peripheral vision at this point. Kind of doing some quick check-ins to make sure that I'm in the, generally the, uh, the right region of the paper but I'm trying to just fix my eyes on the subject oh, and not drop my shading stump. Um, trying to fix my eyes on the subject and kind of react to it in a very gestural way. Uh, and I'm not making any sort of kind of corrections at this point. I'm just getting this, these light marks on the page. And that one is kind of a skip and I'm rolling the, the shading stump in my fingers here uh, to kind of get to a new portion of, of charcoal. And one of the things I can do is I've got my vine charcoal here. I can kind of load it, um, load my, my shading stump by just kind of, kind of running it over the vine charcoal here, just picking up a bit more charcoal. Um, And I'm trying to move around the subject as, as much as possible. I don't want to get locked into any sort of um, you know, particular feature at this point. I want to continue to move. And what I like about this shading stump as an option is that it allows me to, again, kind of sneak up on the portrait, these light marks. Uh, starting to block in these areas of light and shadow, but I can move between generally a line and a shape fairly quickly. So I can think both linearly and in terms of a mass. That, that mark right there is a little distracting because it starts to feel like a, a form. And I don't want to get bogged down in features, but it can be kind of helpful to just kind of start to indicate the eyes. And I'm not, I'm going to kind of talk a bit about the proportions in a bit, but I think it's helpful to already, you know, to have something on the page first. I really like that, that brow. There's a distinct shadow there. Um, and that, that can become a bit of a, a nice kind of anchor to, for the proportions. Um, and so you can see that I'm, I'm utilizing the side of the shading stump, again, to kind of help me to think in terms of shape uh, a bit more easily. Um, you can see the light coming in from this side. So I'm, what I'm also looking for is a kind of a general expression of, of that, the idea that light's coming in here, this is in shadow. Do some negative drawing. If you, as I start to go through, 
and I kind of erase down some of these marks to make adjustments. So these, um, it's really helpful at this point for me to, you know, I need to be skeptical of all of my marks. I can't trust that any of them are accurate at this point. All right, so you can start to see that I've got kind of general features suggested. Um, and, and now I can start to do more of an assessment about the proportions. Uh, so what I can, what I want to start to look for is that, you know, I've got generally the eyes kind of dropped in there. I've got the chin, I've got the top of the head, I've got the mouth, nose, and I've got that brow, that point there. Um, another key feature I think is going to really help me is a, he's got these um, distinct kind of cheekbones, right? They're, they're, they're prominent in that, you know, I can see kind of the, the kind of the widest point and then they have a specific angle to them. Um, and so there are a few things that I want to be looking for. I want to be looking for the distance between them. Um, and I also want to be looking at those, their location relative to the eyes. So um, that's where I can start to make some uh, specific decisions around that. Um, Nia, you're saying you're struggling with doing noses and eyes. We'll definitely kind of get into that um, as we go through. Um, Alice, you're asking questions about using tone paper. I think tone paper would work great. I'd say give it a shot. Um, it might work. The process is going to be a little bit different. What I would recommend if you are using tone paper is to focus on the additive portion of it first. So adding the charcoal, then add the lights in on top of that. So if you watched the bonfire video last week, I used that similar process, doing a lot of work with the charcoal first and balancing the, the darks and the shadows with the, the tone of the paper, seeing where you're at, and then bringing the highlights in just where you need them. So hopefully that kind of gives you some suggestions. So. Um, Let's see, uh, Sandy asking a question, um, yeah, so I've got the, the list of materials that I've got there. Um, okay, just checking for any questions, I'm not seeing anything more, but okay, back to the proportions. Now that I have kind of a rough indication, like right in here on the side of the head, I see a distinct reflected light coming in, and I love that, that angle there that can become a tool for me. So I can use it again to balance um, the, the width of the, those cheekbones, uh, also you know, with the, the placement of the eyes. So if I look at that distance there, between the, the widest point of the cheekbones, I can then carry that, that distance from the chin up and see where it gets me. Um, with, the, uh, with the reference image in front of me, I'm going to do some um, comparative measuring. So if I close one eye, it gives me monocular vision. I, I flatten that space. I hold my shading stump in front of me, and I align this portion of the, the, the head, the, the cheekbone there, with this end of the pencil, or with the, the shading stump. And I'm going to use my thumb to mark the, the other cheekbone, and that's going to give me a specific measurement, a distance. If I take that with that, my, my thumb locked, and I turn it and align now my thumb with the bottom of the chin, I see that the distance from the chin to this, this brow, that, that nice kind of triangular shape in the brow, that distance should be the same as the distance, the widest part of the, the distance between the, the two widest parts of the cheekbones. So this distance here should equal that distance. So if I take that, that's generally it. So that my shading stump happens to equal that, that width between the cheekbones. I compare that to the height from the chin to uh, you know, upward, and I can see that that tip is way up here. And it should be aligning with this part of the brow. So now I have to, I have to make a decision. Do I keep this? Do I lock the width down and adjust the height? Or do I take the height and adjust the width? And I think in this case, what I'm going to do is adjust the width. So I'll take this distance from the brow to the chin. If I, if I really kind of anchor this down here, so I, I want to make sure there's plenty of room around the head. If I take that distance and then turn it this way, actually, let's see, maybe it's easier with this pencil. If I take this distance, turn it, then right here, from here to here, should be the, the, where the cheekbones align. So that brings in, that's going to bring that in here. And kind of erase this down a little bit. Bring this in a bit more. 
and those are very kind of big measurements there, you know, just com kind of comparing the width to the height. And then within that, I start to break that down even farther into more specific uh, proportions. So now if I take this and I turn it, that should, that's generally in the right spot. But it's, so it's really helpful, that's why I, you know, I, I like to get marks on the page. I, give, I have something very specific to react to. Um, and then I can make a very specific decision on how to correct it. Um, it's difficult to do that if we start by finishing one area and then moving to another. Uh, so now we can, uh, you know, if I have, if I've indicated the, the width here, if I've given myself those parameters and I know that this is fixed here, that, that point between the eyes on the brow, then I, with it, within that I can work on the eye and place that. Now one of the things I notice here is that you know there's a there's a kind of a uh, there is kind of an uneven placement of the eyes so the eye on the right is a little bit higher than the one on the left and then there's a particular axis to each eye so this is relatively horizontal on this side the right eye has a slight angle upward and is a little bit higher so that right eye is going to come up a little bit there and I still have my anchor point here I've got the width of the cheekbones established um, and then, now that I have this region, I can kind of focus on that at, at some point. I'm going to kind of come back to that. But hopefully that's making sense. Um, if you do have any questions, again, calling it out in all caps is helpful. Um, it's something that we've been doing as a community for a while, so I'm more, it's, I'm more likely to see it um, if it's typed out in all caps. Um, so again, kind of sneaking up on the proportions. And if we, um, if I start to... Uh, indicate the shadow for the eye socket before I do the eye, it's going to make it easier to control those proportions. Because one of the things that I've always struggled with, and I've seen other students struggle with it as well, um, is you know, when we go right to drawing the eyes, we have a tendency to make them larger than they actually are. And that's true with really anything. Anything we, we put our attention to tends to grow. It's taking up a larger part of our um, of our consciousness and so as a result we end up drawing it larger than it actually is um, and so I like to kind of sneak up on drawing the eyes a little bit by trying to draw the shadow of the socket first and then place the eye in there uh, and so I'm trying to keep it fairly abstract try not to define it as an eye first because once I do then my kind of symbol system starts to kick in where I, I start to think about all the, all the ways, I've, all the eyes I've drawn before, that, that image in my mind of how an eye should look, and I start drawing from that rather than observing what this eye in particular looks like. And that's why I think observational drawing is so important um, because it helps us really kind of address those assumptions that we make about how to draw something or what something should look like. Um, I think I'm going to actually pick up the, the, the vine charcoal now because the shading stump's really kind of running dry. Um, start to indicate some marks on the page. If I squint, I can start to see these regions of dark values. start to see the shapes of the shadows as well. Uh, I think it's really helpful at this stage to allow your focus to remain blurry. Uh, because I think as we start to focus on details, um, it, again, they, we, what we put our attention on, what we focus on tends to grow. We, we distort our our understanding of its, its true size. So I just want to be really careful not to focus too hard on anything at this point. Um, and one of the things I also like to think about what's helpful for me when I'm working on portraits is think about this as being um, an inside-out drawing. So kind of starting from the inside working out rather than the outside working in. Um, and for some of you, it may work the opposite. It may be better for you to draw the shape of the head first and then fill the features in. Um, where I tend to struggle with that, though, is that I 
I tend to draw the shape of the head too wide. And it's a consistency that I have. I do that all the time. Um, and then I have to go through and correct it. And once I shift it to this kind of an inside out, um, kind of anchoring the eyes and nose and mouth and then building out from there, I tended to correct that a little bit more. Um, and then Twizzle, you're asking a question about it, the width of the head, including the ears. Yeah, it does not include the ears at this point. I'm just going to the widest point of the cheekbones. And I think what I want to do is kind of, I need to focus on the shadows a little bit more, just kind of really defining the light and shadow side. Just using my fingers to kind of wipe that down. I can still lightly see the marks, and I think it's picking up on the camera, um, but I can start to, I can still kind of see those initial marks that I used with the shading stump to lay out the proportions. Uh, now I think I want to block in the forehead, and I think it's going to be helpful to actually really lock down the top of the head. So if I know that the height from the chin to that brow is the same as the distance between the two widest points on the cheekbone, then um, I, can, I can use that to help evaluate the, where, the, where that forehead goes. So what I'm, what I'm doing now is I'm aligning the top of my shading stump with the top of his head, and I'm moving my thumb down to where the brow is. And I'm carry, then I'm comparing that to the distance between the brow and down, down towards the chin. And it looks like it, it comes in right at the bottom of his lip, that bottom, the bottom edge of his bottom lip. So if the upper lip goes somewhere in here, the bottom, the bottom lip comes in somewhere around here. And I can start to kind of lock that down. I'm going, to put the, I'm going to put kind of a darker spot here for the tip of the nose. Okay, that's an interesting. So if I take the measurement from the chin to the bottom edge of his bottom lip, that's the same distance as then from that bottom edge of the, the bottom lip, that bottom edge of the bottom lip here. This distance is the same as from the bottom edge of his lip to kind of the tip of the nose. And it's generally pretty pretty close. I'm kind of in the ballpark. And so that means if I can take this distance, distance again, then from the brow to this portion of the lip, the bottom edge of the lip, is the same as the distance from the brow to the top of the head. So I can take that as a measurement, carry it up. Actually, and it looked like I had initially got, put the top of the head in correctly. So. Um, and so even though I'm taking these measurements now, I'm fairly confident in them, but I need to be skeptical throughout the entire drawing process. Um, again, moving my eyes back and forth to you know comparing the the reference photo to the drawing, looking at the drawing more to see that I'm generally in the right part on the page. Um, but I'm trying to put as much of my attention on the um, on the reference photo as possible. And then here's where I can start to drop the ears in. And I'm looking at the placement relative to the eyes, the bottom edge relative to the nose. Using that shading stump, again, I'm using the side of it, not the point, because I want to be thinking more in terms of shape. Now I can take a horizontal measurement, measuring across the face to find the bottom ear the bottom edge of the right ear, because that, that right ear is a little bit higher than the left ear. The top is a little bit higher. It's got a, kind of got a kind of a tilt to the head. And then as I'm doing that, I'm also thinking kind of kind of about some negative drawing. So as I'm drawing the ear, thinking about the shape, the shape of that cheekbone that comes in on top of it and that kind of obscures some of the ear. Uh, you know, one of the reasons I chose this, I found this reference photo on Pixabay, um, and I, I settled on this, this photo um, because I liked, liked the way the light functioned. It, there's a distinct light and shadow side, um, and with a, with a straightforward portrait like this, sometimes working from like a magazine image, they can tend to kind of wash out and we lose any sort of shape, shadow shape and light shape. 
this has more distinct sh shadow shapes and light shapes. Um, it gives me something that I can really um, latch onto in terms of those shapes. Uh, so if you do end up working from, say, magazine photos, one of, again, one of the things that can be challenging is often those kind of glossy photos um, kind of wash out the structure of the head too much. Um, this is more of a kind of a classical lighting structure with light coming in from one side. So something to think about. It just gives you a bit more information to work with, um, making your job that much easier. And if you're setting up a, a portrait, if you're drawing from uh, drawing from life, which I always recommend over drawing from a photograph, if you're drawing from life, um, you know, try to be, really take some time to think about how you're setting up the the uh, the, the sitter um, and how it relates to the uh, the light source, and ask yourself what is what information is the light giving me the um, the shape of the light and shadow. And I think it's going to be helpful at this point to start to suggest some of the clothing so in the neck so that I'm starting off from a point of where he's kind of anchored in an environment. Wipe that down a little bit, smudge those lines out. Um, And now I can kind of start to go through and start to refine some of these shapes. As I'm looking at this, just again, my eyes are blurred right now as so I'm looking at the reference photo. And I'm noticing some things that need to adjust in here. And I think I need to drop the eye down a little bit from where I have. And I'm thinking more about the eye socket than the eyeball itself. Um, this drawing may go a bit longer than some of the other ones. Uh, you know, I think in the, in the episodes in which I've done portraits, they tend to run closer to two hours, so I'm gonna keep at it until I'm done, but <laughs> just giving you a heads up. This does go up as a recording, if you're wondering. If you do wanna come back later and observe it, you'll be able to see all of it. Yeah, Sandy, uh, offering a, an observation about the placement of the year, yes. It definitely does feel too low, and so the question is, is do I drop that eye down? Uh, because, you know, again, I've, I've kind of anchored this kind of triangular um, furrow in the brow. Um, that becomes my, the, the point from which I evaluate my other proportions, and I think I need to bring that eye down. Um, and then from there, I'm going to adjust those eyes. So I can start to become a bit more um, start to refine the shapes a bit more, um, but I, you know, found, my, found myself mentally. I'm like, I started fixating on the eye, <laughs> so I had to tell myself, stop, move on to something else um, before I get locked in. I'm not ready for detail yet because, um, as Sandy pointed out, you know, the, the placement of the ear is not even correct yet. The placement of the eyes, uh, relative to that, aren't correct yet. Um, and last thing I want to do is jump into those details before I've really identified where they need to be. Um, trying to see this shape. I can start to see this somewhat triangular shape, but the, the shadow shape and the eye socket coming down over the cheek in here is really kind of an interesting one. Um, so I'm trying to observe that, and it might be easier to try to Kind of break it apart into two sections so kind of the semi-triangular form here and then i don't know i don't know what geometric shape that would be but this shape the shape under here um and i think i want to double check those proportions so i think this needs to come in a little bit on the cheekbone um, i'm trying to address curves as a sequence of short straight marks rather than one long curve. Um, so that might, that can be helpful too as well. So if you're looking at the cheekbone, you know, you know, one approach would be to try to create one long curve. Um, I think what generally is most more effective is to try to break it down 
as a sequence of shorter straight marks. And if I take that, compare, okay, so I'm kind of in the, still in the ballpark here. I want to make sure that I, I'm not drifting in my proportions a bit here, so okay. Anita is saying it's so much easier to draw anything but a face. <laughs> what other subject is not as necessary to be as absolutely correct with placement as such. That is exactly right. Um, that, that is so true. I mean, there is something, you know, as humans, we are primed to see faces and perceive very subtle shifts in, uh, in expression. And that's why, um, you know, a, a portrait can be so tricky is because it's very easy for them to be slightly off in the eye and all of a sudden the person's angry or excited or, you know, we, we change that expression and maybe it doesn't even become that person anymore. Um, so the getting those proportions, there's just more at stake in part because our brain is, it's a machine for kind of perceiving those and, you know, differences and reading expression, reacting to expressions, even if we don't really understand it um, you know, on, from a cognitive, on a cognitive level, um, we react in a more subconscious way to expression. Uh, so again, one of the things that you, it's, it's really helpful, a, a tool that's really helpful to build, is that when you're making a mark, continue to check in on your location within the rest of the subject. Uh, so, you know, as I'm, as I'm making the marks, doing a quick check-in, where am I relative to the eye, to the nose, to this eye, to the mouth, to these other cheekbones, like just very quickly kind of evaluate that and if it's kind of awkward at first, um, it gets easier over time and becomes more second nature. Um, but so much of drawing is about making a mark in one location but putting your awareness on another um, and kind of splitting your awareness to some degree. That there's this there's this particular angle of this reflected light coming up over the kind of the temple that I feel like is I, I need to make sure I, I have correct because I feel like it starts to build um, built from there the other all the proportions tend to build from there um, the other thing I have that's really helpful is I have the the image of the drawing itself from this camera above me is projected on the on the screen in front of me. Um, so that's my mechanism for stepping back and seeing the drawing in a new context. Because I'm looking at it at an angle, it's distorting its perspective. If I only focus on this, then it's going to be off. Uh, because my brain is compensating for the perspective of the paper as it recedes away from me, and it's going to distort the perspective. Um, so, if, so as a result, I have this projection in front of me that is vertical. I can see what it looks like from a vertical perspective, and it's also smaller. So you can achieve the same thing by just simply setting it up across the room and looking at it from a distance and making sure that you're vertically oriented. Uh, and in an ideal world, I would actually have this on a, on a vertical easel, and then I, would, I wouldn't have that issue in terms of adjusting the, um, the perspective or calibrating to that perspective. All right, so I feel like I'm starting to get closer in, to those proportions. I do you want to kind of lock in that, that chin? There's a, I could start to see what's called the line of termination. It's a term that I haven't used in a while, but it was a big element early on in the series and when working with uh, light and shadow. So the, when we have a distinct light side and shadow side, there's a point at which the light ends and the shadow begins. That's called the line of termination. Um, and it's a really helpful, um, a, a, I don't even know, landmark, I guess, a really helpful um, thing to be paying attention to um, because that's what is going to really create that sense of form. So I can see that line of termination running right down the middle. Um, and then the shadow uh, kind of gets picked up over here. I'm using my fingers to picking up the charcoal. I'm using my fingers to draw more because again, it keeps me from getting bogged down in details. I'm trying to squint my eyes, and when I squint my eyes, I can see that line more clearly. It gets a little obs little obscured in the mouth um, because of the way that upper lip is, is somewhat in shadow. 
uh, need to kind of create this semicircular form in here where the neck is. And this is vine charcoal, so it's very soft, and you know it's going to kind of a, it's going to wash out um, over time. All right. And then with the shirt, again, I, I don't really have much information on there, so I need to get something down there, and I can start to adjust the proportions a little bit later. All right, so it's coming together, and, and if you're new to the series, you wouldn't have heard me say this before. If you, if you have been with me for a while, you'll know that my thought process about drawing is that it's all about allowing the image to emerge on the page. I'm trying to bring it up all together at once, rather than create an outline or, or something and then, f then you know, finish in one area, move to a next, and finish to another area. Um, so ideally, what would be happening at this stage is that we could look at this and, and recognize this person. We, we say, oh, that's, that's the subject, that's who we're drawing right now. Um, even though we don't have any of the details, ideally I'll have identified the most critical elements and have replicated that. And because then it's a matter of bringing up the, the detail um, kind of all at once, you know, moving, doing a little bit here, a little bit there, kind of moving through the drawing that way. Uh, and when I'm using the vine charcoal, very light, I'm using the side of it to kind of scrape across the surface. Um, I'm just kind of using my eraser here and I'm kind of doing some check-ins on the shapes of the lights. Now doing a little bit of negative drawing in that I've been focusing on the shape of the shadow. Now I want to take, switch my thinking to the shape of the light. I like that transition under there. My sh the shoulder's cramping up. <laughs> it's really uncomfortable. Um, but it is what it is working at this table. Okay. And double checking that, that was my main measurement, the width between the cheekbones and the distance between the chin and that, that furrowed brow. All right. So I'm feeling pretty good about it. Um, uh, I need to ask him about the line of termination. So we can start to see that a bit more clearly now in, in the drawing. So the line of termination is that point at which we transition from light to shadow. So if we look at the nose, for example, light's coming in here, we have that distinct light shape. Over here at shadow, right where they meet, there's that line of termination. That's the, that's the point at which the light stops and the shadow begins. Because then once you get into that shadow side, you're going to have bounce light, you'll have reflected light. And so if we look at here, at, at the reference photo, we see a distinct reflected light that's not as bright as the light over here. And so I can be just kind of mindful of that. It's, it's still pretty visible, but it's not quite as bright as that. So. Uh, greetings, everybody. Uh, I, like, I love seeing where everybody is chiming in from. So, if you haven't shouted out yet, I've you know seen people from all over. It's awesome. Um, thank you, Carol, for monitoring the um, the discussion feed for me. Carol's on our team here at Ours Network, um, and she is invaluable. So I appreciate. It. I get to see lots of blocking going on. Um, curious what's what's happening so thank you um, all right now I, I feel like I can start to become more precise with um, with it now I'm going to ignore the background you know what's nice about the reference photo is it's generally light um, you know we can see some of the landscape He's got, the, the photographer had this really strong depth of field so the background is out of focus um, and and that brings the subject forward more and I think I'm going to make the choice to just leave that white for now and just focus on the proportions of that. So, um, by, <laughs> Brio, I will do my best to go faster. <laughs> I know this is taking a little while, um, but that's the nature of portraits. Um, so now what I can do is now I can start to get into the, uh, the more specifics and kind of the details. So I've got my, my charcoal pencil here. You can see I'm just utilizing it on the side. I like this the way this way of holding it, so I have a kind of like a chopstick. It's just like one kind of wedged in there, um, 
and I can just utilize the side of the pencil a bit more. And I can kind of rotate up when I need to get a sharper point. Starting to think about some of those finer details in there. Um, I think I need to drop this eye down a little bit more. So this is where the focus starts to come in, so I may be speaking a little less as I try to focus more on some of these details. Um, this is just kind of the next pass at this, and I'm not going to finish the eye, but I'm adding more specificity to it. trying to look at this shape. I'm, I'm, I'm almost thinking more about the, the space around the eye than the eye itself. I know this is going to be off in a little bit, off in here a little bit. So I'm going to, uh, to come back and gradually correct things. Uh, and I really want to, I, I like utilizing the side of the pencil because it creates a more broad mark. And then it's, it's uh, constantly kind of sharpening the pencil, so I do have a fine point when I need it. I'm moving across to this eye over here, kind of looking, almost, again, kind of drawing from the outside in to, to find the shape of the eye. But I don't want to add any more detail than what I have here until I've kind of started to define the, the rest of the features a little bit more. And it gets, this, it gets really tricky in here, but I'm going to come back to that and try to describe the structure of the eye a little bit more. At this point, I'm not really thinking of, about anatomy. I'm thinking about shapes of light and shadow as much as possible. I'm, possible. I'm trying to be more abstract-minded than um, kind of anatomically-minded at this point. Uh, because later, I'm going to add more kind of an anatomical understanding take what I know about the eye and kind of apply it to this. Um, and thank you for those comments. Yeah, so um, I get a good comment here about the shape of the square from uh, uh, the, the chin from Wendy. And that, that's a good observation. It's something I'm going to make note of as I work my way down and I start to refine more. I'll, I'll continue to check those, um, those angles there. Thank you for kind of calling that out so I can, again, be mindful when I get to that spot. I can start to draw the nostrils in here. So what's... What's more important to me right now, so rather than, than defining the individual nostrils um, and the, the shape of the nose right now, you can kind of see that there's a general shadow across here that we, as we roll kind of down from the light down back into that upper lip. Um, and then there's this little bit of light catching in here on the inside of that nostril, but um, I, wanna, I, want that every, I want all the features to be unified by the light in the shadow. So if you can kind of see that shadow shape, it's going to help you to render the, the nose more effectively. Um, and again, with as with the eyes, I'm going to kind of talk about the structure of those features as we get into them a bit more. Um, right now, if you're following along, then um, what you want to continue to do is just double check to make sure that you kind of have everything generally indicated and in that they're generally the right um, placement and the right size. You know, and then we can continue, continue to refine the specific shape. But it's, it's hard if they're not the right size and they're not in the right place, then um, you can make that eye look exactly like, like it is, um, but it won't, be, it won't read like that person. 
So I'm just kind of softening up some of these marks. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, now within that shadow that we just established, I'm going to kind of suggest the nostrils. And rather than think about them as a kind of an oval shape within those nostrils, I'm looking for that the shape of the upper portion, that upper curve, kind of defining that and then letting it fade down into that shadow rather than draw an oval and then fill it in. Because it's not really an oval form. Um, it's got a particular quality to it, a particular shape that we want to observe. And draw this crease here against that upper lip to get that shadow. So now we're moving, Wendy, into that spot you are just talking about. Um, we're starting to get down to the jawline. And I'm kind of wiping down these marks. I don't want to get too dark in some of these areas um, yet until I get to the, the details a bit more. Alright. Just doing kind of a quick check-in some of these proportions because what's happening is that I'm going to, as I move down to the mouth, I'm going to be using the nose and the eyes as a guide to place those. And so I need to make sure that, you know, that I've um, got some effective landmarks um, in place. So I'm kind of working on the cheekbone here. A crease around the mouth. I kind of indicated already a bit where that lower lip darkens. Um, and then we've got kind of a structure underneath here. Or you can start to see a little bit of a crease there and it gets darker right in here. And I'm kind of working my way, just kind of like it, with the eye socket, I'm working my way around, in the space around it, and into the features. And for me, I find that that becomes more effective, and it may not work for you. Um, but uh, what I've always struggled with is um, when I draw the features and then move out, I, I don't get them quite right size, I don't get them in the right spot, so I find it better to kind of flip that around and think about the spaces between them and work into the features rather than in the opposite. So I, what I need to do is I, I, I could feel myself drop, dropping that mouth down too far. And I want to be careful not to use lines too much. Because what happens with a line is that we read it as um, the end of an object and the start of a new object. And with a, within a, with a portrait, the eyes and nose and the mouth are, are features of the same object. And if we separate them, then we, we run the risk of creating um, what I refer to kind of as a, as a Mr. Potato Head drawing where you know, we have the features stuck onto a, a round object <laughs> rather than the round object kind of folding in and, and con containing all the features. Um, you know, the great portrait artists, you think about Sargent or Rembrandt or um, such, you know, they, you, they have that quality where you understand the structure of the head um, in that the eyes and nose and the mouth, are, they're just pieces um, of that larger structure rather than individual, you know, objects that are on there. do some negative drawing to establish that, kind of wipe that down. So hopefully this is illustrating that, that kind of sneaking up on the portrait a little bit. Um, trying to maintain an awareness and a control over the shadows. Um, now I'm going to move down into here, into to refining the, um, the, the jawline. So doing some angle sighting. So similar to the comparative measuring I was doing before, if I close one eye and I can align my pencil with a, with a section of that jawline, and I'm breaking that jawline down into a sequence of shorter, straighter marks, letting the marks overrun, and the 
here's where I'm you know, working horizontally like this, or kind of at a slight angle. If I was working in an easel and I had the subject in front of me, I could align this up and I could just transfer that angle over to my drawing. So vertical drawing, vertical reference, or live subject, and it's very easy to transfer those angles. What I have to do here is, because I'm going from vertical to mostly horizontal, I have to take a mental note of that angle at which I'm, I'm angling this pencil and then try to carry that down. Um, and that becomes a little bit more challenging. And so you may be, if you're following along and you're working on a tabletop, you may be experiencing that. And it's something to consider. This is, that's why, again, that's why it's really critical to kind of tip your page up, look at it at a distance, um, and to kind of double check your proportions. And so as I'm going along, as I'm refining that jawline, I'm using my comparative measuring and my angle sighting, but I'm also trying to compare it to where I'm at in the rest of the, the, rest of the head, looking at the space between the mouth and the, that chin. Now this one's a really tricky one right in here. So it's really hard to identify the specific angles right in along in here. And welcome Fran from Issaquah. It is starting to take shape, I hope, so <laughs> I don't know, you have potato head. Um, that, but that's, that's the thing that what I, I try to help students with is, is you know, drawing the spaces between the features. We get caught up so much in, the, again, the eyes and nose and the mouth that when you shift our thinking to the spaces between them, it can really help bring things together. But yeah, it's starting to take shape and I'm feeling a little bit better about the overall proportions. So then I can start to take the next pass through the proportions, and, or through the, the, through, through the features, adding um, more specificity, more detail. Um, but I feel like the This is off right in here. I feel like the jawline is a bit better now. If you if you were watching the, the portrait I did of the girl, um, <laughs> I really struggled doing that one. That was a tough one. Uh, but it was really helpful, again, to have you all um, pointing out your observations. And so that's why we're drawing together. Um, kind of wash that out a little bit here. I want to provide a little bit of shadow because I really like that shape right in here of that light. I can use my rubber eraser to kind of erase that out. So I need to, I'll, I'll be coming back into this area a little bit more, but I need to have something to kind of anchor the, the portrait to. Okay, next pass at, I think we'll, maybe we'll go up to the eyes. There's not, I'm just gonna, before I do that, I just wanna make sure that I, that there's nothing here in the forehead that's gonna impact them. I'm not ignoring something that is going to be critical for me later on. Um, working with edges is really a key to portraits as well. Um, and that's where, you know, working with an outline, if it's too heavy, it can kind of flatten out the, the portrait because um, we, our goal, or my goal here at least, is to really create a three-dimensional head, right? Not a mask, not a two-dimensional cutout that's on this paper. So trying to create that sense that we're wrapping around the cheekbones, back to the ears and nose coming forward, the eyes are in a socket, there's structure to it. That's one of the things that, one of the things that we're really looking for. So, all right. Um, I'm going to take my shading stump and you're always contributing to the form so right now I want to be I'm kind of blending in some of these marks but I'm trying to also define the form you're always contributing to the form so the shading stump isn't just a tool for smoothing out marks 
it's an opportunity to correct the form. And so now I'm actually, I'm kind of, I'm, again, I'm working from the outside in, working around the eyes into the eyeball. And what I'm looking at are the, the smaller shapes of the shadows that create the creases under the eye. And with this tool, it, it helps me to think more in terms of shape than line, which I think will ultimately create a stronger uh, structure. Get that, that really cool crease right in there. And then I can go back in and I can make some of these shapes darker. Um, but this is starting to be adding a little bit more detail. Again, trying to think more in terms of the shapes of the light and shadow rather than drawing a line. Observing how, yeah, this is the, the, the eyeball is a, it's a sphere. So it's, sh you know, this side, the light is coming in from this angle. So it's lighter on this side and it wraps around the sphere. It gets darker right here on the inside of the eye socket because it's actually set behind the, the eyeball. And then I'm going to be using my eraser to pull up the highlights right in here. I'm going to need to do that. But I want to be, I want to keep my focus on the shapes of the shadows right now. You can really see that play in light and shadow across that lower eyelid where you get strong light here and into that shadow. Really distinct um, shadows here under the eye. So I'll have to do some negative drawing in there using the eraser to pull out that, that form. Yeah, so I'm seeing some, some good comments about the shape of the mouth. That's something I'm going to have to think about as I get down to that part and I start to refine those a little bit more is getting that, that corner. Like right now, it's just, they're, they're just kind of a general shape and it's, you can feel the pull downward of the, of the mouth, which is creating an expression. So I need to really be focused on that when I get down to that spot when I'm going to be kind of refining that a little bit more. Um, so we have somebody causing some trouble there, huh? Um, thank you, Carol, for <laughs> monitoring that thread. I don't know if Susanto needs to stop, it looks like. Um, So again, I'm trying to think of structure, looking at now the smaller shapes of shadows. Um, if I'm focusing on the eyes now, then I can start to do some negative drawings. So use my shading, I mean, I needed eraser here to pull out some highlights. And this is not a great tool for a lot of control. So I'm, I'm recognizing that I'm overstating some of these highlights, but then I'm gonna come back in and re kind of correct them with that with that shading stumper with other tools. Right in here, there's a really strong light. And I, I, this is really interesting structure here in the eye socket, the way the eyelids kind of fold in on, on, you know, into the eye socket. Um, and it's something that, that, for me, that's one of the areas where we can really distinguish the individual um, in, in a portrait is to look at that particular shape. It's like, you know, just like the creases in our hands, they form because of the way we use them and the particular shape of our hands. And so um, the, um, the, the way the eyelids fold into that eye socket um, is another opportunity there, you know, to really distinguish you know, that person. Um, kind of smudging out, again, looking at the structure I'm looking at the, the right side, the nose, relative to this eye. What I need to do is kind of 
shaded in over that edge where the light's hitting. It's starting to feel a little bit better to kind of define that a little bit more. And then the, the, the way the light is striking the nose, the light is strongest right here on this nostril where it turns around that, that kind of corner in the nostril. And then it's stronger right in here as well. Not along the tip of the nose, which is generally the case you know with portraits because the light is generally not in coming in from the side like that is usually like at a three-quarter angle which puts a spotlight here puts a spotlight right in here and any kind of major turn tends to catch that light a bit more um, okay so i'm just using my shading stump again to try to define that structure a little bit more moving through the drawing trying not to get bogged down in one area again too long um, it's almost like I, you know, like, you know, I, when I come into an area, I got to get in and got to get out quickly. If I start to labor on it too long, I need to come back to it um, with, you know, w with fresh eyes. It's similar, so <laughs> I started. I did my I, I, for the first time over the weekend. I, I tried fly fishing here in Colorado. It's a big thing for people to fly fish. So I thought, all right, I'm going to give this a shot. Uh, and reading this book, one of the things that it said was that you know, if you're in a stream and you have a sensor where the fish might be, you're casting into that stream, after about three casts, if you haven't caught anything, move on. Because either you've probably already scared the fish away, but you know, you're, you test it a few times and then you move on. You test it and move on. So that's kind of what I'm doing here as well, is I'm getting into a spot, working on it for a little bit, and moving on, and then I'm gonna come back to it with kind of fresh eyes and see um, how you know, how, how I interpret the forms there. So, so just kind of keep that, something to kind of keep in mind as you're, as you're going is that, you know, we, again, the more we stare at something, the more it kind of distorts in our mind and on the page. Um, okay. Next pass, I think, I know I'm gonna to need to refine the, the lips a bit more, but I'm going to, I'm going to get back to the eyes a bit more. Um, but I'm trying to see if there's anything down in here that might be helpful when rendering the eyes. Yeah, um, yeah, I, T artist flame. They make some good observations about the shape of the eyes, so I'm going to keep that in mind as I as I move back up there. So thank you. Picking up more charcoal down in here. Yeah, if you guys remember that drawing of the girl, it's just popping into my head right now that I did a few weeks ago. Boy, <laughs> that was quite a struggle. Uh, but we all, we hung with it, and I think we came out with something that, that works pretty well. So I'm hoping that we'll have a greater opportunity for um, accuracy with this drawing. Okay. So if you are new, if you've kind of found us and you're joining in, I'm Scott, I'm with Artist Network. Um, we meet every Monday, Wednesday to draw together. We're here to practice and get better. I don't consider myself a master. Um, so if, if what you're looking for is someone to demonstrate their master techniques, I don't know if I'm the right person. What, I'm, what I like to do is I like to practice, examine areas where I can improve, and then we can all kind of go through that together and see where, how, how, can, we, how can we get better as artists, so um, mastery is a funny thing. Uh, all right. Now I'll move back into this eye. Again, I kind of, I kind of have the cycle moving from this eye to this eye down the nose, down the mouth, and kind of back around. And I'm feeling pretty confident now in the the size and the placement of the eye so I can start to um, render that shape a bit more clearly. So that upper eyelid 
generally is in shadow, so it's generally a heavier, darker line because you have the shadow on the eyelid itself, and then it's often casting a shadow onto the eyeball, so it creates a kind of a thicker line. Um, and then, we, it, remember, it's a sphere, um, and so it's that line that we're making isn't, you know, isn't a, an, a curve that, you know, isn't just like an arc, it wraps around the eyeball. Right, and this is kind of a tricky here. So we have the darker line forming the, the, the bottom edge of that lower eyelid, and then we have that crease right in here. And then as we go into that shadow, it starts to disappear as everything kind of wraps around into this eye socket. And as you can see, I'm using, utilizing the side of my pencil. I find that that helps um, me to think in terms of light and shadow, think in terms of shape more than line. Um, when you're going for realism, you, uh, you know, lines don't exist in nature. They're an abstract construct that we've defined as uh, representing the edge of an object. Um, and if we overstate our lines, if we draw everything as, in, as a contour line, then our brain says this is a series of individual objects rather than one thing that we're drawing. It's kind of a forest and trees argument. Um, and now, so what's happening here, you can see how thin the line is, that, that shadow is on the lower eyelid, and then it catches the light and it rolls down into shadow. And there's a bit of this kind of triangular dark. And so as I'm working on these creases, rather than drawing a line for this crease, I'm creating, I'm trying to visualize that path and then create it as a series of kind of wiggles that follow along that path if that makes sense. Yes, every line counts. Bringing, bring the collar area up when you can. It appears that the, it is next too long. That's a good observation, so thank you for that. So I'll, um, what I think what's gonna be helpful when we get to that point is once I say lock down that nose, I can utilize that to help um, kind of triangulate the proportions of other areas. So I think, yeah, right in, right in here. Oh, yes, look at that. It's way down. Kind of jumped ahead there when I saw that. Good observation. L cure to QT. <laughs> I don't know who that is. Some of, the, some of the screen names is kind of hard, but thank you for that observation about the collar. Um, Look at that. Yeah, that was way off. Um, just kind of lightly sketch that in. Wipe that down a little bit. Okay, so where am I? Back up in here. I need to continue to refine these forms. And as I, as I work here in the eye socket, I want to be mindful of that edge along here as it wraps around up onto the brow. And now I can kind of reestablish that crease. I can come across into this eyebrow. Got this that line there. That's a little bit better. Um, so I'm trying to think in terms of the kind of more of those abstract shapes. But as you go through, you know, there's again look for that light across the that eyelid. Um, the, I'm trying to look at the the size of the. The, the eyeball here, the, the iris and the pupil. And in particular, what I'm looking at is I'm trying to balance the positive and negative space in here. So looking at the whites of the eyes, I'm trying to try to make sure that the, the size of the iris and the pupil together aligns with what I'm observing 
you know, the resulting kind of negative space with the whites, whites of the eyes is correct. And there's a bit of a shadow here cast up on the side of the nose. So that's, you know, lights coming in across here. There's a high point right here in the center of the eye that's casting a shadow onto that side of the nose. I think that's going to be a helpful observation to make. Looking for the shapes in here. And you can see how this line really comes down into the creases that come out here, right along here. And then we have this really distinct light shape coming here. So I'm going to erase out that. I've overstated it, and I'm going to cut that back down and refine that a bit, a bit more. down now watch let's see back to my shading some this is where I can start to add a bit more structure and make sure that that's all correct so there's a lot of this just back and forth um, back and forth between the shading stump and the eraser pick up some charcoal over here just gonna need to load it up a little bit more Seeing some comments come in, I didn't quite catch some of them. So if there's a kind of an important question about how something is done, I'm missing it. Uh, Brian, or you're saying that you're trying to hold the pencil like this. It's it, you know get trying to find whatever's comfortable for you. I mean, this works for me, and I kind of stumbled into this approach just by working, but just the the intent is for me to try to utilize the side of the pencil. That's ultimately what's most important, is to be thinking about the side of the pencil. So if you need to have like an overhand grip like this, that might be more comfortable for you. But I found this is just a bit more natural for me, but it may not work for everybody. focusing a bit more so I'm less talkative at this point because I'm really trying to observe the shapes and I'm, I'm not confident that I'm really getting it but uh, you know we're again with the, the general philosophy is that we're trying to bring up the whole drawing together and gradually adjust gradually add detail so that you know if I were to call it quits right now you could you would understand what I'm drawing and hopefully who I'm drawing These are really kind of complex forms in here. Um, one of the things to look at to try to determine in the shape of the eye and the upper eyelid, the high point tends to be on the outside of the of the eyeball here, and then you know over here it's kind of more kind of in the middle. But try to observe where those high points are. They tend to not necessarily be directly over the center of the eye. So over here there's a it's, it's not a symmetrical form, the, eye, the shape of the eyeball. Let's see. And we have this thin shadow here. So right in here where we have these creases, you might find it most, more effective rather than draw a line this way, just kind of wiggle up along that path. Um, and that you're, the, the eye is more likely to read that as a thin shadow rather than a line. Again, once the brain interprets a mark as a line, it's a trigger that it's a separate object. And it's going to interpret it that, that way. Whereas a thin shadow, if it reads it as a thin shadow, you know, then it'll, it'll be perceived as a kind of crease. I think this brow needs to come down a little bit, let's see. Uh, 
Sharon's saying, I'm doing a lot of erasing. Is there a trick to getting the resultant dust from making a mess work? Um, let's see, I don't know. Is it the, if it's the eraser dust, yeah, you want to kind of just blow it off like I just did there. If it's the charcoal dust, yeah, you might, again, try to, try to, try to blow it off more than try to um, wipe it away. Um, I don't know if that's helpful, um, but it, it also could kind of be the paper itself. Um, and if you're working flat, it's going to be more of a, tr a problem. Um, if you're working vertically, then all that dust falls as you work, and so it's less critical, you know, less of an impact. That's true when you're working with pastels as well. It's like the, if you work vertically, then all that dust falls as you go, rather than kind of building up on the page. Oh, uh, yeah, no, I, um, I've seen the comment here about uh, making suggestions or you're taking classes with Johannes. Absolutely, I love to see comments and suggestions. You know, that's kind of why we're here drawing together and this isn't just watch me draw. Hopefully that as you're drawing along, you're, um, you know, coming up with questions, observations, things that you can share that would benefit the rest of the group. I'm doing some negative drawing in here because I feel like I, I need to define that shape of the kind of the, the temple there. Okay, let's see. Thank you. How do I capture heart expression facially? Is it jaw, cheekbone? Is he smiling? So, yeah, I think. Um, Ginny Murray, you're asking about how to kind of capture some of those subtle expressions, um, and it's, it's it's definitely possible. I mean, that's generally the challenge, right, in drawing a portrait is how to capture not just the likeness of somebody, but the experience of someone. And um, it, it does come down to subtlety. And I think one of the things that I learned, and I. I'm hesitant to give you an answer because I don't consider myself an expert in portraits. <laughs> That's why I'm doing this portrait, right? We're kind of learning from this. I need to practice this. And if I stick to my wheelhouse, which are landscapes, I'm never going to grow as a portrait artist. And I'm not going to be clear about what I can take from portraiture and apply to my landscape work. So within the context of me, you know, becoming better at working in portraits, um, I can say capturing the expression a lot of it comes down to just sticking with it. We tend to give up too early. Um, and if you feel like, if you're, if you're working and it's an exercise and it's just become a mess on the page, um, and you know that you can't really reclaim the drawing, it's just, gonna be, it's just gonna be a mess, then that's a perfect opportunity to really experiment and play around with the marks that you're making um, and how it might lead to greater expression. Um, you know, so what we what we've often will often do is we'll get to a point where we say, now this just isn't going to look like that person, and then just give up. Just keep going and see, and treat it like an experiment. See what can you what can you glean about how materials um, work that can ultimately lead to a you know, better expression, um, and just kind of stick with it. You get to kind of sometimes fight through your drawing. Um, I I've mentioned this in some of the other. Um, classes is that you know we all drawings go through what I call an ugly duckling stage where you feel like it's just not going to come together um, that it is going to just fall apart and I think that's where drawing gets really exciting or drawing and painting all art gets really exciting when, when you kind of reach that that threshold of, of it all just kind of falling apart because that's when your your voice as an artist starts to come through and you you know it you're going to solve that problem in a way that other artists don't, and that becomes part of your kind of your signature, your style, whatever you want to call it. That becomes how you solve the problems. But don't give up on it. I think is my biggest suggestion. Um, but right, I mean, I think the the expression is captured in the eyes, and we're highly sensitive to expression and. Um, and sometimes you just you just gotta continue to work on it. I don't know that not necessarily a satisfying answer because it'd be 
great if you say, well, just do these, you know, these five things, take these steps, and you'll get the expression just right. Um, I think in general, the approach of thinking about it in terms of light and shadow, building the drawing up gradually, that is what's going to ultimately lead you to greater success. And then as you do that, as you, as you continue to practice, you're just going to get better, and you're going to strike the, the correct proportions more quickly. Um, you kind of work through your problem solving more quickly. So now I'm, I'm trying to think of more about this, the cheekbone as a, as a structure right in here. Building up some of these values. I'm doing less squinting than I did at the beginning. I'm starting to apply a little bit more focus, but I think it's important to continue to squint. I feel like that you know, expression starting to come together in the eyes. And this is where I have a lot of admiration for great caricature artists um, because so much of what makes a good caricature artist is, um, and a good caricature is really latching on to what's unique about the, the person and then you know, we, we talked earlier about the importance of getting the proportions correct. As a caricature artist, you're intentionally creating incorrect proportions. <laughs> but they're incorrect in a way that enhances and it, it, and it draws from the person that, you know, that, you're, that you're working from. And by exaggerating it, you're actually um, you know, perhaps expressing something more about their emotional state or something about them than you know, perhaps a straightforward... Um, academically correct um, portrait might. So um, one of the things that you might do is if you are interested in exploring portraiture uh, you know, and becoming a better portrait artist, um, look and study the some great caricature artists um, out there and see what they do. See what you can learn from them. Draw on some of these creases using the shading stump. Thinking about the light and shadow in here. So I'm kind of working, finishing from the inside out. That gives me an opportunity to correct those outer proportions if I need to. But I feel like this is starting to come together. How long are we at? We're about an hour and a half into this right now. And I figured, like I said, we'll probably be at this for a couple hours. Um, and you're going to work at a pace that is comfortable for you. Um, some of you might be much faster at getting to this point than I am. Some of you might need more time. But own the pace. I like to think about that too while we're working. Is, is finding a medium that allows you to work at the speed of thought. So however fast you're making observations, try to kind of manipulate the materials to express that as well. And that's why I think for me, charcoal works a little bit better than graphite. Um, so with, with charcoal, I can make an observation about a shape and relatively quickly be able to express that observation. With graphite, because it lends itself to creating kind of finer lines, I, I might make an observation and then it's gonna take me 20 minutes to fill in that shape. <laughs> and by then, maybe I've kind of lost it you know, uh, as I go. And so I like to be able to react more quickly um, to things, if that makes sense. Uh, let's see. Now, as I as I want to create the kind of the rounded um, features here in the eyelids, what I'm going to do is you can see I, I kind of wipe that down. I'm building up kind of the haze on there. It's not the bright white of the paper. I can, I'm going to erase out those highlights, and I want to. I want to really understand where those highlights need to be. So I'm going to come back in and I'm going to attack the, um, the shadow shapes again. Ah, let's see. I think that line is throwing me off. I need to establish that a little bit more. I need to need to get this shadow right in here, 
right in the crease. And now what really makes him feel rounded is to have the darkest part of the shadow not necessarily be right up against that edge. You know, so make a, a make your shape and then just inside that edge where you, is where you add that the darkest sharp part of the shadow where the crease is. And come down in here, there's the eye socket there. Um, you switched and I have enough charcoal built up, I can use my shading stump to pick up some of that charcoal. I'm going to draw on this shadow here. And that light across there. Get some the shadow shapes of the creases a bit more. I'm just focusing a little bit more so talking goes down while I focus. <laughs> yeah, and then the uh, uh, Thori, yeah, I'll definitely be getting to the ears a little bit more, but I need to, need to keep that in my mind, like you're saying here. So the ears have not been resolved. In general, I I want to finish the ears to a lesser degree than other features that helps to push them back farther. Right. Thinking about this structure right in here. Okay. I feel like I've built up that, that shape around the eyes a bit better. Can suggest some of that texture right in here. And now, you know, if I kind of wipe that down, now I can locate that the highlight. So if we look at just this little crease right in here, that there's a strong light, but it's not right up against that shadow, it's just set in a little bit, and that's what's going to help to create a sense of it that it's rounded. And then in that shadow area, again, kind of more in the middle of that shadow area is where I can drop in a deeper part of that, that crease there. And that'll hopefully make it feel more, more lifelike, more rounded out there. So, you know, now at this point, hopefully what you've seen me do is draw that eye numerous times. Each time it's just getting a little bit better a little bit more refined, um, but it's, you know, again, we're kind of sneaking up on it rather than trying to get it right out the gate, you know, get it all correct in that first strike. Um, and I think with these creases, if you're struggling to kind of create them, less is more, you know, really be kind of subtle to it. Our eyes fill in detail very effectively. Um, so we, you know, try not to overstate them. So yeah, all texture is all about there being less, less is more. So I'm feeling better about that. Let's see. Yes, Krisha is making a good comment about the the cheekbones. Again, I'm working kind of working my way from the inside out, and so I have them roughly kind of sketched in. But like you said, I need to go back in now and start to refine them a little bit more. So right in here, there's a bit of a kind of negative drawing that needs to happen where I'm drawing that hair behind the cheekbone, and I want to be really careful not to create too strong of a line. Because um, if I do, if I draw too hard and consistent of a line down that cheekbone, it's going to flatten out and I'm going to be drawing a mask, not a three-dimensional form. I'm kind of working my way back and forth across the, across the page here. So if I start to kind of sketch in the ears,
So I do appreciate all of these comments and observations, and, and f please feel free if you're if you're holding on to something, throw it out there. I take no offense. That I'm just kind of uh, trying to lock in the ears a little bit more so I can use them as landmarks. Um, Algeria, all right, holy smokes. Yeah, it's awesome seeing everybody, you know, people from all over the world. Uh, it, it becomes a little bit of a distraction. I need to remind myself, I got to keep going, but um, it's thank you for kind of shouting out where you're from. Um, it kind of blows my mind that people are joining from all over the world. I'm here in Colorado. Um, it's another beautiful day here. So I'm trying to, I don't want to over render the ears, but I need enough of an indicator that I can, that it's going to actually help me with the cheekbones. Hands are getting a little little filled as I have the as I have all these tools in my my left hand here. And it's important to keep looking. I found myself what I found myself doing there is getting locked into my drawing and I stopped looking at the reference photo and I had to do a quick check in. I could hear my critical voice. It says, get back to the reference photo. Always be looking at the subject. Um, in general, you know, the, the, the rule that I you know, tell myself is it marks your thoughts. Um, every mark I make is a thought, starts as a thought. And if that mark isn't what I need, I need to go back to my thinking about that mark. What am I really basing that mark on? Is it based on an observation or is it based on the way I feel about something? Um, and, you know, there's certainly applications where you want to um, express the feelings about something, but, you know, um, in this case, you know, I think I want it to be more accurate, so I need to be, make sure that when I'm making a mark that it's based on my observation of something. I'm going to start to suggest some of these creases. Sometimes we get a shape right, but until it's rendered as a three-dimensional form, it feels wrong. You know, there's a switch that happens in the brain when we start to interpret something as a three-dimensional object as opposed to a two-dimensional shape. And early on in the drawing, you know, we're doing a lot of shape drawing. And I've done that so many times where I'll, I'll work on something and I'm like, I measure it, it says it's correct, but it just doesn't look right. Um, but if I, give, if I give it a bit more time and trust my initial observations, then I find that all I needed to do is um, continue to work on its three-dimensional nature and I interpret it more effectively. So let's see. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, squinting as much as I can. observation that I'm making right in here. I feel like that expression starting to come together in the eyes at least. And if you notice the you know the eyeballs, I'm keeping all those edges really soft. One of the things that can be destructive in a portrait is to sharpen the edges too much, especially around the eyes. Uh, so if you're you know there might be something to double check with your own work if you're struggling in that area. Don't be afraid of there being a soft edge. Um, can come back in here. Pull out the highlights a little bit more. And sometimes you just need to move to a different area. Just kind of decompress a little bit. Move to an area that's a little bit easier. There's less at stake, like the forehead, for example. Um, that can be a little bit more loose. I'm going to be off a little bit more because there's no 
thing really cr as critical as the eyes, say for example, up there. Um, and they come back down, and, I, and that's all setting me up for the nose that I need to get to. Um, I recognize this is running longer than some of the other ones, so thank you for sticking with me. Um, so Nia is saying that the distance between the eyes and the bottom of the nose feels a bit too short. So that's a good observation that I need to double check as I go through. Um, let me see, I'm going to check. So one of the general proportions I'm seeing in the reference photo is that the distance between, you know, from the side to side of the nose, that distance is about the same as the distance from the, that, that brow to the bottom of the nose. So that, yeah, that would bring that bottom edge right down in here. Right in there, that does make it a little bit a little bit longer. Thank you for that observation. So this line, I've, I've drawn too dark. If you look in the reference photo, it's much more subdued, um, much more subtle. Uh, so I need to need to soften that or just be mindful of that before I render it too much. And you can see this very kind of distinct triangular form here in the inside of the nostrils there. Switch to this grip. And then right in and the nose here gets really dark right under here. You get that thin sliver of light Pay attention to that the, the edges there. I think we don't want that light to get too strong. So build up that shadow, I think. I lost that. There we go. I think I kind of lost the structure of the shadow. So this is what I call a wash, where I'm I'm looking, I'm, I'm kind of building up the value of a whole area on top of those details that I added. And I need to build that wash up. I need to darken those values a little bit more. Now I can come back in here. And again, kind of observe how there's generally a shadow that runs across the bottom of the nose. It's interrupted by that light that thin sliver of light there. But how's that look? Does that feel all right? I feel like that's okay. Um, thank you for those comments. Christian, seeing that the proportions seem to be working out all right. Um, I tend to, I, I, I think it's important for, for all of you to do this as well, as if if you find yourself making making not mistakes but observations consistently, um, you know it's just something to kind of be aware of. And sometimes that just something you kind of embrace. Like I know I, I generally I draw the mouths incorrectly. I, I tend to draw them too low, um, and then I go through the process of correcting, and that just starts to become my my mo. <laughs> I just start to I just know I'm going to be doing that, and then I, I know I kind of expect my, that I'm going to be correcting mistakes in a particular way. So sometimes it can be helpful just to kind of identify what those mistakes are. Um, and then just you become a little bit more forgiving, perhaps, of yourself. You know, you just know, here, here it comes, I'm going to be making, I'm going to be flubbing this line at some point. And, and that's just part of the game is that I'm, as I go through it, I'm going to be correcting it. So the, the distance, the, 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 the length of that upper lip is one where I, I, I tend to fumble regularly. And as I've mentioned in, in previous ep uh, episodes of this, is that that's one of the, the ways that you can authenticate a work of art is by seeing how certain mis mistakes are corrected. Because um, you know, master artists, they, they tend to do the same thing. They, they, they tend to 
correct the same types of mistakes over and over again in their work. It's a little bit of reflected light here I want to pull out of that nostril. So I love this kneaded eraser because I can form that shape. So I overstated it and now I cut it back down, kind of wiping it down a little bit. Okay. Is that feeling better? Feeling okay, looks like we're getting some um, some approval about the proportion, so it's great. We have Shipla, second grade. Nice, welcome. We have students of all ages here. One of the things that can be really um, challenging as an artist is we, we tend to compare our work to the work of others. Um, and it can be both good and bad, however you interpret it. So if, if you work, if you look at somebody else's work and you say, hey, I like what's happening there, or I don't like what's happening there, using it to inform your own, your own vision, your own um, kind of aesthetic, your own skills, then great. Um, what, I, what, I, what I've seen in some people, though, is they'll sometimes they'll just kind of give up, and that's a, kind of sad. So what I, you know, hopefully what I, you know, what I like about, you know, drawing is that, you know, you, you don't have to show it to anybody. You don't have to call yourself an artist to enjoy drawing. You know, I could stand up right now and dance and I don't have to call myself a dancer to, to actually dance. Um, but for some reason, sometimes we, we pick up a pencil and we start drawing and we, we start to acquire all the, the labels of an artist. We kind of apply that on our, onto our work and then we limit ourselves. So I hope that's not happening with any of you. So what I'm doing right now is I'm avoiding the, the rest of the, the mouth. <laughs> and I'm kind of going back into the, into the eyes, kind of touching up some areas. But in my brain, I'm thinking, i got to get to this mouth here because it's, um, it's not defined at this point. So... Um, as I said, I've always kind of, that's been the area where I've struggled the most in the past, and, and I'm feeling confident about these other areas, I'm like, all right, here it goes, <laughs> I can ruin this whole thing, um, but I need to not be controlled by that fear right now, let's see, okay, there's a, kind of a, the way the light strikes that upper lip, I, hope, I'm, I know I'm leaning into the shot here, so I'm going to do my best to, to not do that. And I'll look at this particular shape. And again, I'm going to kind of sneak up on it in terms of its value. Sitting kind of awkwardly in this on this stool to try to get these angles and not get into the, not dip my head too far into the shot like I'm doing right now. Actually, what I need to do is I need to evaluate the length of that upper lip. So this distance here, from, like the length of that shadow on the nose should be about the equivalent to where that bottom lip ends. And I think I dropped it down. I did it again. I kind of drew that upper lip too, too large. Kind of just laying down some charcoal that I'm going to refine uh, a little bit more. So as I get to the corner of the mouth, now I have I have to kind of get kind of triangulate its location, figure out where it is. So I'm putting my awareness on the nose, the the eyes, see where it should be. I could do some angle sighting. So if I line it up with the edge of the nostril and the corner of the mouth, this angle right in here kind of puts that corner right there. And if I do that with this the left side here. It puts the corner of the mouth right, right, right around in here. I'm going to lay down some charcoal in roughly the size that I want. Lay down some charcoal right under here. I'm going to pick up my shading stump and now start to define that edge a little bit. Because uh, one of the things, that, uh, one of the areas where I see an otherwise really effective portrait start to fumble is the, at the defining the edges of the mouth it tends to, you know when it when it gets overly defined that's when things can really start to 
um, to fall apart. So if anything, I want to be more subtle, um, and kind of intentionally subtle with the, the with the lips, and overstate them. In the side of the pencil here, so I avoid drawing outlines because there's no line around the, the the mouth. There's some thin shadows. There's no real line, and I want to observe that roll from light to shadow over here as well. So make sure I'm not flattening that out. I want to make sure that it adheres to the general structure of light and shadow. And I'm going to be working my way from the inside out. The, the edges aren't, aren't fully defined yet either, so I want to make sure that once I've locked in the, the lips, that, they, um, that then I can adjust the, the jawline to suit that. So right now I'm going to use my eraser to pull out the highlight right here at the, right at the very tip. That lip kind of projects forward a little bit. There's some texture in here. Grab my shading stump, pick up some charcoal here. And then I'm going to draw some of the, the kind of creases in here. But again, I want to be thinking about this as shapes of light and shadow, not necessarily lines. And again, this is where I've seen an otherwise really effective portrait fall apart is starting to get in there and start to draw each of these shapes as lines. And again, what we mentioned before is, that, is if our brain interprets it as a line, it's going to interpret it as a contour, the edge of an object, rather than a crease or a shadow within that object. And so as we look at the shape of that mouth, um, I did, I did a, another kind of portrait episode where we focused on the mouth, the lips, and the nose, um, and we talk a bit about it there. We see that there's kind of a general roll to that bottom lip. That upper lip kind of comes in and out of that. So if we look at the corners, that upper lip is generally on top of the lower lip, and then that lower, it shifts, and then that lower lip kind of projects forward a bit, and then the, the upper lip comes in on top of that lower lip again here at the front, kind of like a, an interlocking beak in a way. You know, that's generally the way mouths are structured. Um, and so you want to look for that, and everybody's mouth is a little bit different, and some are more pronounced than others in, in that in that area. Like his, his mouth, I think, is generally pretty subtle, that overlapping between the, the upper and lower lips. But that's something that you want to look for so that it doesn't, as you're, as you're drawing the crease in the mouth, it's not just one continuous line across there. You know, break that up and try to look for that structure. So when sometimes when you're drawing, you're making a mark, you're drawing the lower lip, and sometimes you're drawing the upper lip. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, I'm going to bring in more shadow in here. And then I can come back in and I can darken that a little bit more. And I think hopefully that will help to create that expression that we were going for. And I can't remember who was talking a bit about it that earlier. But he has this kind of look that he's you know, got this slight smile. There's a pleasantness there I think it's important to capture. So all right, before I, you know, I don't want to get stuck on there too too long. So I want to move on and maybe come back and make some adjustments and corrections there. But how do we feel about that? I feel like overall that that's working out pretty well. Um, what I've lost actually is up here, the kind of the definition of that upper lip. And so I need to make sure that my head doesn't get in the way. Um, so, and I, if anything, I want to kind of convey is this idea that you're constantly going back and forth. You're adjusting. You're moving things around. Drawing isn't simply an additive process, or it doesn't have to be. Um, it's you're it's you're you're moving pieces around on the page. You're constantly adjusting. So as I'm drawing, kind of the the subtle mustache that he's got, I'm doing some negative drawing, leaving a, a gap there. Um, before that lip uh, starts. I'm going to pick up some charcoal here. I need to 
to lay down some charcoal. I'm doing a charcoal wash here to put this in shadow. And I'm going to now continue to refine this. So now what I'm looking for is there's that, there's that, that lower lip here um, where the crease of the chin is. And there's kind of a compound shape. There's kind of a cylindrical portion here. And then there's this, this kind of compound cylindrical form that comes in on top of it. Um, that's what I'm trying to observe right now. And then I can, I think I need to pull out some reflected light right in here. So just with the kneaded eraser, it's really a subtle touch right in here. Very subtle. Yes, I've seen a good, uh, Himala is that saying that the lower jaw needs to be shaded exactly. So we're kind of working our way down, working our way from the inside out. So, so again, thank you for sticking with me for this long. This is a little bit longer than we normally go, but I feel like we're getting closer to the end because I'm going to kind of su be suggesting some of the other forms. I will create some selective focus here. But you as, you know, the artist, if you're following along, if you're new, you know, and, you're, and you want to follow along the the, the reference photo is in the description below the video. Um, you can find additional resources at artistnetwork.com um, and, and on all our past episodes. Um, and I, I really encourage everybody to kind of share your work. So if you go to artistnetwork.com and you go to the Drawing Together page, there's a link in the description below. Um, you, it'll take you to a page where you can um, share your work. Each episode has its own show page. Um, and I've seen some really wonderful work being posted there. Um, and so that's kind of circling back around to what I started to say there, and I got a little distracted, was that, you know, you're going to decide for yourself how far you want to go with this portrait, how much detail do you want to add. Um, I'm going to continue to work on this. I think, you're, you know, if I'm not doing a whole lot more fundamentally than what I've been doing, um, but I... Um, I think I want to stick around and see how you know what more details I can add to this, and then I want to decide well how far do I want to take that? You know, um, you know do I want to apply that same level of detail to um, other you know other portions of the drawing to the shirt for example? So I'm just kind of using the shading stuff again if you're. If you don't use a shading stump, this is a tool that I never used. <laughs> I was really actually not against it, but like I, I, I could never use a shading stump. And then I started this series, and I, it's been an invaluable tool. I use it in every episode now, and I love it. But I think it really shifted for me when I, when I questioned how I was utilizing it. So when, in the past, when I was using a shading stump, I would use it really just to smooth out an area. It wasn't wasn't contributing to the drawing in any way. I was just kind of smoothing out the marks. When I realized that it, it can be an, a, a, an opportunity to refine the form and actually make marks, then it really started to transform. So I try to be thinking um, no differently when I'm using the shading stump than when I'm using the charcoal. I'm always contributing to the form. Uh, so right in here, I'm getting a little bit lost. So I need to think. Uh, as I'm following up along this crease, I'm looking for that compound shape. It's not just a straight line, it's not curved, it kind of curves up here at the top. It's like a bit of a subtle compound curve in here. Um, so much of portraiture, figure work, is really observing compound forms. Um, that, you know, so it, Sorry, I'm just kind of thinking through this a little bit. It's taking a lot of my focus, and I just lost the thought. <laughs> it happens. Um, but kind of going back to, again, artistnetwork.com, we've seen a lot of really wonderful drawings posted on the show pages, so I'd love to see the work that you're all making. Um, and if you've been following along and you have something to share about your work, you know, an observation about the process, what's working, what's not working, what um, you know, questions you might have. 
So I, what, I, what I found myself, I found myself making that mark, making the angle of the chin, and I realized it wasn't based on anything but my own gut, how I felt about it, um, and I needed to stop and double check it. Um, but so now as so we're working up to the edges, I think it's really important to um, be conscious of what you're doing at the edges. Because um, this is again where it can go from being a three-dimensional head to a two-dimensional mask. Um, and masks are tricky because we often feel uncomfortable by masks. Um, and you know, and, and kind of put off by them. We don't, we don't generally respond positively to, to uh, people in masks when we feel, you know, that we, we can't read their expressions. And, uh, you know, I just realized that we're living in a time when masks are part of a discussion that, <laughs> to a greater degree than we might have ever thought. But, you know, hopefully that it makes sense what I'm talking about. Not necessarily, I'm not thinking about like a, a protective mask, but a you know like a Halloween mask, you know something like that. It, it, we we are tend we tend to be um, yeah less receptive to masks, and that's it's part of that you know the the uncanny valley, you know the, some of the you know looking at you know images of people when they feel like they're close but not quite there, it can be really unsettling. Um, and, you know that happens in video games, movies, things like that, where you know we're using computer-generated images that feel really close, very accurate, but there's something there that's not quite right. Um, edges play a big role in that, and so you know again, if we do everything right in the drawing, so we get the proportions right, but then we we see a hard line around the edges, that can be a trigger in us that says, wait, that's not a, that's not a three-dimensional object, that's something two-dimensional, there's something there that's going to trick us. And um, so you just want to be really careful. You look at some of the great artists, somebody like, like Sargent would be really, um, really mindful of how line was being used in, um, you know, to, to provide expression to raise this ear a bit. Um, so it's it's not that it, you can't it can't be done, you know, but you just want to be mindful of it. You want to be thinking about the edges as in a very conscious way. So I'm trying not to render the ear too much, but I need to get enough of it where it doesn't become distracting. How's everybody doing? Uh, Vimala's is saying that there's a slight difference in the cheeks. Yeah, that, that's something I'll, let me keep that in mind and, and, and come back to it. I'm gonna, I'm kind of moving back and forth between the two sides to, to make those observations. Um, and what I'm trying to do is rec understand kind of the, the asymmetry, and make sure that it's asymmetrical in the right way. So, right in here in this cheekbone, I need to be really careful of that edge because there's a spot right in here where it's more clearly defined, and then it's kind of subtle in here. Like the, the edges get a little bit softer. And so, as I'm doing this, my, I'm putting more more attention back onto the drawing. I mean, onto the reference photo. And I'm trying to uh, I'm trying to put my awareness into my peripheral vision as, into what my my pencil is doing, the angle that my pencil is moving at. Let me try to double check some of these. And then right in here, I need to figure out how I'm going to do that. I, this is so undefined right now. I think I need to do a little bit of negative drawing. So I'm actually drawing the ear, but the purpose of drawing those these dark shapes in the ear is to define the cheekbones. Doing, I have a horizontal line, I'm comparing the bottom earlobe to the nose, which I moved the nose, and I needed to come back now and adjust the, the ears, because I had drawn them originally relative to the nose. When I moved the, moved the nose, now the ears are off. Right. 
Hopefully that all makes sense. There's a nice light right in here on the inside of the ear. And I don't know enough about the anatomy of the ear to be able to help you with that. I did do a drawing of an ear early on in this series, so you can, I'll go back and check that, where I just drew a photo of my own ear, because it's such a complex form, and it's, it's so unique. Um, I'm just going to kind of wipe down that, that highlight there, because I see there's a hot spot right here where the light's strongest, so it means everything else needs to be a little bit darker, and I can pull this out with a needed eraser, pull out that highlight right there. And there's another hot spot right here on the lips. And maybe right in here. Oh, I didn't get that shape quite right. Right in here, that crease in the mouth. Here. I can come back in and I think I need to add a little bit more contrast right in here in the nose. I'll have to pull that forward a bit more, feather it out at the bottom so it's a little bit sharper at the top, more diffused at the bottom. Kind of let the, paper, let the pencils kind of skip across the surface to create that the mustache. Darkening this underneath the lip here a little bit more. And now I'm going to come back in and start to, right now it's feeling mask like because I haven't really tied it onto the neck. Um, so I need, to, I need to do enough of the neck so that it feels like it's anchored in part of it. But I don't want to do too much because I don't want it to be distracting from that. So there's that, you got to think, we got to think about that balance. Um, you know, how much do we need to add in terms of detail? And this is again where Sargent would be really good at this, could you know, draw a really wonderful likeness and then be more um, suggestive of other elements in the, in the drawing in a really effective way. Just this little bit of highlight. This is this highlight on the, this catching on the neck is really kind of critical because what it what happens is that it's it's right adjacent to this dark shadow underneath the chin, right here in the center, and that is going to really help to create that three dimensional look. Popping that chin forward, the high contrast area coming forward, pulling that 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 chin out, and now you know, I can kind of narrow that highlight down a little bit. So it's not quite as dominant as I had just created it. So I've, I've exaggerated the highlight, now I'm cutting it back down, make it a little bit narrower, more, uh, more like what I'm seeing in the reference photo. And then dark here, so there's this alternating sequence of in the, the value relationships where we have dark on the chin, light on the neck, come over here, it's it's dark on the neck, lighter on the chin, and that's uh, that alternating sequence is really helpful in creating a sense of depth. I can't quite remember who it was that pointed out the the collar. That was a really good observation earlier on. I had drawn it way too low. So kind of doing some negative drawing, drawing that blue, that blue collar to define the edge of the white one.
just going to suggest that I know you all have been with me for a very long time and very patient <laughs> as we pull this all together. And I know this has taken a while. Um, It's important to stick with a drawing to really kind of fight it out, you know, as you saw me do with the in the episode of the portrait of the young girl, and that was a fight. <laughs> and you were all stuck with me, uh, and I really appreciated that because you were pointing out some really wonderful things that helped me to to improve the the drawing. Um, let's see, Sharon, got to take off. Thank you for joining us. The right part of the mustache should be darker. I think it's kind of changes the shape how it's too light. Uh, that's a good observation there. Um, I think the whole mustache needs to be darker. Uh, who, who made that? Uh, Yassine? I hope I'm pronouncing everybody's names correctly. I'm really horrible at this sometimes. So I apologize if I've mangled anybody's names. Um, that was a wonderful observation there. Move over here to this one. And I want to I want to be careful and I, wanna, I still want it there to be a roll of light and shadow. So I want this right side to be a little bit lighter, but like you observed, it was perhaps too light. So utilizing the side of the pencil, just letting it skip across that surface a bit. The lips themselves need to maybe get out a little bit more detail. How do we feel about that? It feels a little bit better, but there's more of a distinct highlight coming in right on that ridge. This is, we're really fighting for this one, aren't we? Um, now I'm looking at the kind of these kind of the jagged line right in on here, but I think I can make this a little bit more, more defined. Just trying to break up that line a little bit. I don't want that to be too hard and consistent. Okay. Uh, Norman is saying his left eye is too big. Could be. Could be, you know, I, I think I, I didn't, uh, that I, I, when I was working in this area, I had made a mental note to kind of double check that, and I don't think I ever did, that, that I might have come not really defined this too uh, clearly enough. There's that, that shape in the tear duct um, that sometimes, you know, if we don't quite get right, then we interpret it as being part of the white of the eye, and that changes how we, that's how, how we, we draw that. And interpret it. So that is a good observation. I think I may have overstated this side over here, drawn it too big. I think that's a good observation. I don't know if that's any better. Subtle changes can sometimes make a really huge impact, have a really huge impact on the drawing. So uh, now there's some texture in here that I haven't quite addressed, um, and I need to ask myself how much I want to. You know, you can see. You know, with, the, with that strong light coming in from the side, you can see kind of clear texture. Uh, but I want to be careful not to over-exaggerate that. So if you do want to add texture, try try kind of sneaking up on it using that shading stump rather than the point of the pencil, um, and, unless you really know you need it. So right in here, I feel like I, this this can be defined a little bit more. in here and then use my eraser to kind of pull out some of the highlights right in my, right here on the eyeball. Kind of pulling that highlight in a little bit so that it continues to wrap around and I just picked up too much of that shadow. And then in here I think that I think these 
creases in the eyes need to be a more dominant feature. So as you can see, I'm not really doing a whole lot, you know, fundamentally different. So much of really the instruction in this comes early on. It's how you set up your drawing more than anything. Um, and hopefully this approach has been helpful to you. But again, this is really just the way I tend to approach it. And hopefully it, it gives you some sort of indicator of, of how I've struggled with portraits in the past and what I've kind of learned as I, as I try to overcome those struggles. Um, They're, yeah, they're definitely not not easy, and I, I see some of these great portrait artists, people that we've worked with, uh, you know, like Nathaniel Skousen, Christy Gordon, um, people that we've worked with here at Artist Network. That I see their work, and it just blows me away. Um, how they capture you know, the the work in portraits, and, and, and it can happen so quickly because they they put the time in. I tend to I put my time in on landscapes, and so. But I'm, I'm really curious to see how this impacts my landscape painting as well. That's why we're, one of the reasons I started doing this is that while I'm at home, I see an opportunity to improve my skill. And hopefully, you know, as I get out, I got, was able to get out and go painting this weekend. I felt like it helped to improve my um, my accuracy. I became a bit more accurate in my landscape drawing, getting to the proportions more effectively, more quickly. We tend to overlook drawing you know, in favor of painting sometimes, and I, I mean, at least I do, and so that's what I found myself doing, was spending so much time painting that I had stopped developing that skill in drawing, and I found it to be really helpful. So I'm trying to think, as I work here in the forehead, trying to be mindful of that structure, looking for the, the, the more subtle shapes of light and shadow, and thinking about the wrapping around of that form. So it doesn't feel like a wall, that, but I feel like it, that there's some sort of structure there. I'm looking for areas where it might be a little bit darker than others. And then you can see as I'm using my shading stump, I'm just kind of rolling it a little bit to create some of those lines. I'm trying to keep them subtle. And again, my intent is that they read as shadows, not lines. Because if I, if I draw a line, then I run the risk of it kind of just popping off the page and I lose that structure. All right, so right in here, there's some light that I can kind of tap out here. Uh, now here's what I want to do. I think this, I need to darken this so right in here pull that highlight out a little bit higher in front of that temple, and that'll pop it forward a bit more. A little bit of light here, so just kind of picking it up with a kneaded eraser. What do we think? Is that, is that feeling a bit better? Whew. Uh, question of, or a comment about the eyes perhaps being a bit too wide open. I, I, I need to kind of double check that. Definitely with this eye, I feel like he's, he's squinting a bit more, but. All right, but I think I, I'm gonna try to start to wrap this up a bit. I know I'm running quite long. We're about two hours and 15 minutes right now. So I just wanna start to kind of rough in some of the shadow shapes in here. I like that light on the collar, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to build up some value here and leave some of that, but I want to be careful not to outline it. Just using the side of the pencil here to, to drop in some of the shadow shapes. Hopefully in a way that's kind of suggests the clothes rather than kind of clearly defining them. Wipe that down. Pull out the highlight right in along here. And I think we're I think we're good enough. I don't, you know, I think I could add a little bit more detail in here, but I don't know, you know, if that's interesting for everybody or not. I feel like you captured the likeness pretty well. 
I'm sure there's there's areas in which it can be improved, but I feel like the overall, like, I think it captures the expression, the, the likeness. Um, I feel like I learned something about it, about portrait drawing. Um, and I feel, yeah, as like I said, if you saw me struggle in some of the other ones, um, you know, I feel more, I feel better about this one than I did in some of the other portraits. I did that self-portrait early on. Holy smokes, <laughs> that was intimidating. Um, I don't think I really captured my own likeness very well in that, but that's why we do this, right? We gotta practice, gotta be comfortable, you know, recognizing that there's area for improvement. We gotta identify where I can improve so that we can get better. So, all right, I wanna thank you all for joining me. We are gonna meet here again on Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern. Um, I wish I could remember, I think I'm doing a wave on Wednesday. That's going to be a lot of fun. Um, and I got another portrait coming up next week. Again, that's an area where I need to improve, so I'm kind of forcing myself to do more portrait work. Um, and I will see you all then. I hope you will all will uh, join me again. Check out artistnetwork.com. Look at the links below. If you want to, you know, uh, click the little bell symbol here, you get notified when the next one gets posted. Um, so hopefully going to be happening soon. I'll get the next one set up. Um, subscribe and um, you'll get notifications when we go live again. We are working towards getting more of these live drawing series going. I know Johannes Bladhaus, he does a, a wonderful paint along series uh, most Saturdays. So if you go to artistnetwork.com, you'll find them there. So if you're interested in painting, he does oils, watercolors, pastels um, as well in, in, his, uh, in his events. And um, that's a really kind of a fun community there. Uh, but I know we're, we're looking at, for Continuing looking for artists uh, that can kind of work with us live so we can expand these, uh, what we're doing here with drawing together into other areas as well. So um, hopefully get some watercolor paintings, some pastels, some acrylics, oils, etc. So thank you all for joining me. I appreciate it. Thank you for all the help. Um, I got a lot of good comments that really helped me to pull these proportions together. Um, I'd love to see what work you do, so share it on artistnetwork.com. Thank you so much. See you on Wednesday.